Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the Virginia MGMA in collaboration with Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and Pennsylvania MGMA. Thank you to our web sponsor, Mag Mutual. My name is Julia Linko and I will be your host. Today's presentation is led by Maryland Kitchens. Maryland Kitchens rejoined PBR Mars Mayors in 2015 and is a member of the firm's tax team. Maryland's original tenure with the firm's formerly PBGH LLP began in 1998 after graduating summa cum laude with Bachelor's of Science degree in accounting from Stryer University. Maryland gained experience in tax preparation and planning, auditing, financial statements, compliance, QuickBook Consulting and Business Startup that specialized primarily in physician practice and was a member of the healthcare niche team. With her return to PBR Mayors, Maryland primarily focus includes business consulting services and performing tax preparation, review and, review and planning. She is currently involved with the firm's development of medical practice consulting services to include practice benchmarking, overhead analyst payment, information system review and vendor selection, employee benefits and human resource policies, facilities planning, executive recruitment, and operations review. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. The viewer window is on the right and allows you to see everything the presenter is sharing. The control panel on the left is how you can participate in the webinar. The audio panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar using microphone and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio using your telephone by selecting Use Telephone under the audio drop-down box. The dial information will be displayed, including the audio pen. We will have two question and answer sessions during today's webinar. One will be in the middle of the presentation and the second one at the end. We ask that you hold your questions until the Q&A session. At that time, you have the ability to send in your questions through the chat box found on the left side of your screen. Simply type in your question and click send. As a final reminder, we are recording today's webinar. You, you can view a copy of the presentation recording on the participating NGMA website. Please welcome Marilyn Kitchens. Thank you, Julia. I um, put Julia through the ringer today. We tried to, we did a test ses session on Wednesday that went beautifully, and today we're having a little bit of phone problems. So I am on a cell phone. So I hope the audio is coming through clearly for everybody. Thanks, Julia, for the last minute stressor. I appreciate it. I um, also want to thank VMGMA for inviting us to come back to present again. We did a webinar last year on top key performance indicators for medical practices, and that was well received. So I hope you get um, some good information out of uh, today's presentation. Julia mentioned the, the, the question. I'll, I'll try to stop in a couple of logical places to take a couple of questions. I've got some sample um, management report printing out for you, and, I, and, and that's it toward the end of the presentation. I certainly get to those, but we'll do a little um, history um, on uh, chart of accounts first. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually our niche team leader for our healthcare services. You see a suite of services listed there that we provide for medical practices. Um, uh, I certainly don't provide all of those. There's a team of us on the niche team that uh, address medical client needs. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit on PB Mayors as a whole. Um, it's an accounting firm at its core. Um, we are a top 100 national firm. We're in the top 100 national CPA firm. We're in the top five firms in the capital region as defined by Accounting Magazine. We've got 220 professionals on staff and we're heavily concentrated in Virginia and Baltimore. Um, so PB Mayors uh, does focus on um, healthcare services. It's not our only industry that we focus on, but it's the only industry that I focus on. Um, before my tenure as a CPA here, I was in practice and management myself for administration for 13 years. So I have been on both sides of a general ledger, um, certainly on the accounting side, uh, making sense sometimes of what I get, and then certainly on the other side, the practice management side, trying to get good 
financial information um, to spit out of, of all the transactions that we've recorded. So, uh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> what is good accounting, and, and, and how can we um, talk about that today in a in a meaningful way? Um, just a couple of quotes, as you can imagine, when you Google for accounting quotes on the internet, there's not a whole lot of material there. Um, but uh, Warren Buffett says managers and investors alike have to understand that accounting numbers are the beginning, not the end all. Not the end all to business valuation, not the, the end all to, to business management. Gerhard Hertzberg had to look this fellow up. He's actually a physicist, a Nobel Peace Prize winner back in 1971 for work on free radicals. And even the scientific community is saying, there's nothing wrong with good accounting except that it may not necessarily lead to good science. And I think what both of these gentlemen are trying to say is it's good to focus on accounting. You have to start with good accounting. Um, but the real exercise is in what we do with our numbers. How, how quickly can we get to things if it's organized appropriately to try to make some good management decisions. And of course, David Letterman says there's no business like show business, but there are several businesses about accounting. So what that tells me is accounting isn't all that interesting, and, and I'll let you in on a little secret. Straight up accounting and, and tax numbers aren't all that interesting to us either. Uh, we like to uh, see what they tell us, interpret and analyze what they tell us, and certainly uh, help our uh, clients grow. So this isn't going to be a boring accounting exercise, but we'll be talking about things um, starting with a foundation level and even a, a granular level. We're doing it with the intent to, to build some financial information that can help you make decisions in your practice. So how does the chart of accounts help us do that? We're going to talk about three areas today. Starting in the pyramid, we're going to cover the bottom, that foundation piece. Um, and categorizing is you know, naming your chart of accounts, picking how many chart of accounts you're going to have. It becomes your filing system for how you capture financial transactions. Um, it's at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, after that, um, as each of your transactions happen, you're going to be classifying those transa transactions. Um, how to do that in the best way to get the information that, that you need. We'll talk a little bit in this section about um, using departments, trying to capture some information for cost centers. And then at the pinnacle of everything, of course, is compiling accurate and useful financial reports, trying to make sense of what's happened. Um, before I go too far, just a really quick uh, question for folks. If, if you know where your chat box is, I'm going to talk a lot about QuickBooks today, not because I'm a QuickBooks reseller or not because I'm a QuickBooks advocate. I just know that the majority of our clients use it. We see it over and over again for medical practices. I know it's because you've spent sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds of thousand dollars on a billing software. So your accounting system um, doesn't need to be as complex because you have so much of your data for income in another system. In your chat box, if you do not use QuickBooks, just type the name of the software system that you use so I can get familiar with the other systems that you might be using. <coughs> so when we categorize um, a chart of accounts, we're going to talk a little bit about, I see Sage, thanks Barbara, um, uh, a uniform financial filing system. You know, there are standards in accounting, and maybe some of you have been through an accounting class or, or you have a financial degree and you're very familiar with that. We'll talk about why that's useful to use something. Uniform doesn't mean you can't customize it for how you need it. But we'll, we'll talk about why it's important to have some standardization there. How to organize. Um, thank you, Karen. I see Workday there. I'm not familiar with that software. Um, organized by management preference. If you know the type of information that you want in, on the back end, once all your transactions are recorded, then we can talk about um, how to organize your chart of accounts or create your chart of accounts to get there. And um, we'll talk about sample chart of accounts if you're looking for help there of where to start. So 
um, this is a really simple um, uh, rendition of standard account numbers and, and types of accounts. For any of you that um, have a robust chart of accounts, you know this is just um, the, the overall picture. Um, but what I wanted to discuss here, when you're trying to pull your information out on your financial report, um, the assets or the account type is going to determine which financial statement it shows up on. I think most of us know if I create an asset account, there's no way I can get that account on an income statement. Uh, in reverse, the same thing with an expense. If I want to create an expense account, um, and it's not showing up on my profit and loss, maybe I've called it the wrong thing and I need to go back and check. It seems kind of silly to mention those things, but we see that all the time in accounting when we get um, general ledgers. Um, so account types are going to determine which financial statement it shows up on and in what order it shows up on. I think everybody uh, who's looked at an income statement knows the income section always comes first, and that's great, and we seem to always focus there. Um, the use of account numbers, um, if you're not doing that now, I can guarantee if you sent your books over to your accountant, they're assigning it a number so they can kind of um, make sense of it because we numbers, crazy number people think um, in this method. Um, I know a little bit about QuickBooks here to warn you. I like account numbers. Uh, to me, they're shorthand. When you go to type in a transaction, you can type in an account number or start typing in the description and it will pop up for you. If you're using QuickBooks and you, some, and you wanted account numbers but didn't have that function turned on in your preference and you put your account number in your description, uh, you've tied your hand a little bit because you can't um, do a shorthand on the, the title of the account and bring that up quickly. Um, so um, if you haven't used account numbers before in the past and you'd like to, um, there is a preference in um, QuickBooks where you can go and uh, turn that on. Now, if you have a really sophisticated software system, um, you, you know your chart of accounts or, or the, you, is going to be much longer than this. But this is just truncated so you can um, kind of see it. Why are uniform financial filing systems important? Um, and I don't think there's a software system alive that's going to let you change the type of account, but it'll let you number kind of uh, however you want to. But whenever people look at your financial statements, um, sometimes our credibility as a medical practice is, is tied up on a, a, a QuickBooks report or a SAGE report that we hand off to somebody else. They're kind of financially judging us on how well we've set those financial statements up and how things are kind of categorized. And if things don't make sense right off the bat, it might set off unnecessary alarm bells for them. So when you go out to a bank, you know, a financial loan officer is looking at your um, financial statement. Certainly once a year you're sending those things, uh, your financial information to a CPA. We're looking at your information. Uh, the longer it takes, to make sense of that information, I think you all realize probably the more those professional fees go up. And certainly practice valuations here, position stock transactions, lump them together. Sometimes you may be selling a practice or romancing a practice and you want to see their financial statement. Or a physician is wanting to buy in to the uh, practice or is wanting to retire from the practice. And you, you start with the financial statement, making sense of the financial statement. And those conversations can go long if somebody starts questioning a particular number just because it might be presented in a, in a way that's not standard. Um, and, and we don't want to delay those conversations any more than we have to. And certainly benchmarking, if you're going to uh, accumulate and compile your financial data and then go out and benchmark it with another practice, uh, you're going to want to make sure you can relatively compare apples to apples. Um, now, organizing by management preference, um, and I hope you can see this well on your screen if you have a, a, a big honker monitor sitting in front of you. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, building the, the chart of account based on what you see at the end. Um, two examples here, one on the left, is really focused on a monthly income distribution. We're talking about distributions for seven or eight folks here every month or a bonus. 
uh, figure deck, and you'll see something right away. Um, I've got two salaries expense accounts. I have two facilities expense accounts. I have two data expense accounts. And of course, these are um, truncated so that you can um, see them here. You see two salaries, um, salaries here, uh, a couple of um, uh, uh, equipment expense accounts. And that's so that this practice can quite easily um, tell a direct expense from an indirect expense. Um, a lot of times you'll think kind of logically, well, I don't want to duplicate accounts. But in this instance, it's technical um, and intentional for them to do that because at the highest level of a statement, uh, uh, I'm sure you all just got reset because this, this reset for me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting back there. That was not me, I swear. Um, so on the income side of things, um, over here on the right-hand side, um, it's your, I won't say traditional, um, but it's just a singular account for each item. Um, pros for both of the ways of doing this, building duplicate accounts spread between direct expenses and, and indirect expenses, you can see at a relatively high level on an income statement, um, these things are totaled up for you. Um, on the right, it's more of a practice-wide approach. On the right, I can tell my overhead number pretty quickly is 43%. I don't have to add anything. I don't have to scroll anything. For uh, the graph on the left, I see I've got expenses here, and I have expenses here, and I've got to add those two together to get to my 43%. It's really up to what the practice how the practice needs the information presented most often. Um, you may have, you know, on, the one on the right, uh, just a con to using that system. If you want to get down to detail for um, direct expenses, then you've got to go break that out somewhere else. A sample chart of accounts. Uh, MGMA still produces one. It's not on the website. I had to um, call the help desk because I didn't see it. I wanted to see what the latest version was. It's version 2016, and there's an item number for you because you can order it just by calling. Um, it's free to national members. It's 50 bucks for non-members. Um, they have two different options. It calls one is normal, one is extensive. They're both extensive. <laughs> uh, they're both. I have uh, several more accounts that, that you might not need, but certainly for practices that are uh, have more sophisticated financial reporting, uh, you might want to take a look at it. The benefit there, if you're a, um, a survey participant with MGMA, uh, almost every time they'll reference the account number system that they use. So if you use their same um, a chart of accounts, you know that you're reporting and capturing the exact number they want to. And then if you purchase um, that data or you're a participant, participant and get it back for free, you know when you do your benchmarking that you're comparing um, apples to apples there. Um, for anybody on QuickBooks, um, if you inherited a QuickBooks file, somebody started it at some point. When they did, they were prompted to pick a template if they wanted to. Um, if they did that, there are account numbers in the background. Even on, if it's on your financial statement, you don't see them. Um, if you go in and turn on your preference to use account numbers, they're going to pop up. You might wonder, where did those account numbers from? It's part of the template. Um, uh, you can change them, and we'll talk about uh, in a little bit about how easy that might be to do. So we got started just a little late. Any quick questions on categorizing, building your chart of accounts um, before we move on to uh, classifying and trying to capture some cost center data? And almost. All but three of us are using um, QuickBooks, everybody on the call. We've got Sage, Workday, and Easy Account. I missed the MCD brand. <laughs> okay, let's talk about classifying your transactions. Let's, let's say we've, we've got it hands down, no problem, on the chart of accounts. We like it. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Let's talk about some of the things that happen when we classify these transactions that might affect the financial information that's sitting out at the end where you're kind of scratching your head saying, uh, what happens if I don't have what I need? Um, I advocate heavily 
trying to capture um, cost-centered data. And what do I mean by cost-centered data? Um, you want to track information by physician. You want to track it by service. You want to track it by office location. Um, some samples there of office locations. I was in primary care for many years. We had six clinic sites. We tracked it by uh, basic address or street address because we wanted to know uh, what was happening in, in each one of those areas. QuickBooks uses a function called classes to do this. It prevents you from having to build a separate rent expense account for every single office that you have or for every single cost center that you want to track. I'm sure for those of you in SAGE, you have departments that you can use. Sometimes you'll see it as a suffix to the account number. Um, I see it on the GLs when I get in. I might have um, four digits that are the same, and then I've got little site numbers or little location numbers off to the side that tell me that you're tracking departments. So that's what I'm talking about here is being able to produce useful information for cost centers um, that may um, get some information to you a little more quickly. Um, unclassified transactions. Um, we see this a lot, and some of you may have these. Oh, just stick it in the suspense account until we figure out what it is. Or QuickBooks has an Ask My Accountant in here, or Ask My Accountant account. Um, and I know what happens a lot of the times. This is the personal auto fuel credit card bill that you have to pay for Dr. Adams, and you don't really think it ought to be a business expense because you know better, but you stick it into the, uh, certainly to ask my accountant um, uh, account, hoping that we'll be the ones that tell you really, you really can't deduct that. Um, but there are other items legitimately, legitimately if you're in a uh, building real estate, for example, you, you've got to have holding accounts until everything kind of gets figured out. And that's okay. Um, just know that if your accounts aren't classified and you're doing internal meetings with internal reports that you're trying to spit out a QuickBook or maybe ex uh, export into Excel, that your, your records really aren't complete until everything's classified. Um, month close is the best time to do that. I mean, we, we, we um, run around like crazy trying to get the billing system closed at the end of the month. Um, same thing with the financial records. Just make sure they're, they're as polished as they can be um, so that if you're trying to present information to your doctor, if they ask for something on the spur of the moment, um, you don't have a, a bunch of stuff sitting in um, unclassified. Um, just some common misclassifications. I won't spend long on this because um, Julie and I were messing around with the phone system. Uh, we see shareholder distributions, personal expenses show up on the income statement all the time. Outsourced payroll entries. I will spend just a couple of seconds here. Um, ADP and paychecks um, are two of the most popular ones. If they're using them, um, ask them about a different level of service that they may be able to offer you, which um, either presents you with a general ledger that takes those cash, those net cash entries that we have to record every two weeks, where they're taking out total uh, tax liability or net pay, um, but you know that your general ledger is not quite what it ought to be on the income statement. Um, there may be another level of service. I know that um, Paychex for one of our clients does it, but it's a sort of a paper adjusting journal entry. Uh, and you have to be careful as you add a different additional payroll accounts. They need to sort of be updated on that. But it is possible to have that help done for you. And certainly your accountant can walk you through looking at your payroll reports and, and, and which accounts to hit if you're interested in that. Uh, so talking about accountants touching your books. Um, uh, at least annually, um, your information is going somewhere to have the tax return prepared. We prepare income distribution calculations for physicians monthly and quarterly, sometimes semi-annually. Um, nobody waits until the end of the year to get a bonus. So we're doing that internally during the year. And if you're, if it's important to you to maintain department information, if you've built that into your chart of accounts, we want to honor that. So just make sure that you communicate your protocol that that kind of department detail, if we can tell what that is, comes back to you in adjusting journal entry form. 
Um, normally attached to your tax return, I hope most of you might get to see that if you're not in a position to, just know that when your tax return is prepared, um, at least the paper copy of an adjusting journal entry usually comes back with that to show you if we've made any entries at all um, to your book, um, then you can have that. Um, I'm not telling you that because I think it makes your accountant happy that your books are right, although it might um, save you some time when your next year's uh, book uh, tax return are prepared. If you're in your office and you want to, once you take a look at some of these reports and you really like them, if you want to use them and you want to compare uh, 2017 to 2016, if your 2016 isn't adjusted, your numbers aren't going to be exactly right. So adjusting journal entries aren't just for your accountant. It's, it's to get the work back into your book so that you can start maybe internally looking at some of this financial information and um, being able to compare uh, numbers right in your office. So those who can come back and always come back to you almost always on paper. There are two automated ways to do it that I know live in QuickBooks. I wish I was familiar with Sage. But um, uh, QuickBooks, we can um, make a file, a downloadable file of your adjusting journal entries and send that to you. You can click on it and download it into your system. As of 2014, QuickBooks invented the coolest um, software function ever to a, a geeky accountant, and that was called the QuickBooks accountant copy function, where when you get to the end of your quarter, and it's June 30th, you can send us an accountant's copy dated June 30th, and we're going to take a look at that and adjust it. We can make adjustments anytime up to June 30th, but you can't make any adjustments after June 30th or before June 30th. So that allows you to keep working without us changing the same file. Uh, I think the only thing it ties your hand on is maybe doing a bank rack. But we can shoot those. Um, AJE is back to you via a server and you download it and you just go on your happy way. I really, really like it. I really recommend it as a way to quickly and easily get adjusting journal entries uh, into, back into your QuickBooks. I, I would hope that Sage would have a function like that. Um, uh, always ask to see your adjusting journal entries first. If you just don't want to take the accountant's word for it, I don't think that offends us. Um, and we'll, we'll help you walk through that process. Um, the fun part <laughs> of the presentation, um, does anybody have any questions on classifying transactions, getting apartment, departments set up in QuickBooks? I can give you, um, it's a function to use classes in QuickBooks. It's under your preferences. Um, it's under your accounting preferences, and that's where, you're, well, where you will find uh, a click button to turn on classes. That if we're in QuickBooks language, that just means I'm going to track department. Uh, you can also turn on your number function there if you haven't done it already. Um, and you can, on the number function, you can actually require an account number. So if somebody gets in your book with your, you know, the seat. CFO of your practice, but you also have an accountant uh, boot cover that does you know, mainly AP and that sort of thing, um, and they have to uh, create a new account, you can actually require that an account number is signed to it before they can save it. So it helps maintain the integrity of your chart of accounts if you want account numbers. You don't want anything showing up without an account number. So that's in your preferences as well. So everybody wants to know about compiling accurate and useful financial information then because I haven't gotten any questions so far. So we'll talk about um, how we can change things. You've done your hard work. Okay? You've, you've built the best chart of accounts you can, and you have classified every transaction 110% correctly, and then you go to print this financial information and it's still not in the form that makes any sense to you. So we're going to talk about how you group like accounts using your chart of accounts, um, how you're displaying your accounts in your report, and how um, changing the display might help you um, get faster financial information. And then generating management reports. I've got some samples in here. Um, one 
to talk about the things that when I was in practice management, we talked about the most. And, and the next is to maybe walk you through some steps in the software to explain um, what some of the options are to you. Okay. Grouping like accounts. Now this is a perfect world, so all my account numbers uh, are, are pretty, <laughs> they're great, um, and, and I've just chosen the things that are uh, uh, really popular to talk about and argue over about in your shareholder meetings. You certainly are, talk a lot about staff expense, uh, position compensation, facilities expense, uh, data expense, equipment expense. I couldn't fit it on here, but you could just as easily have um, pharmaceuticals, drugs, medical supplies. If you're uh, if you're heavy into pharmaceuticals and, and drugs as a uh, as a heavy cost for your practice. And what does this do besides look kind of cool as an organization function? If you're grouping like accounts. When you go to print your financial statement, it tolls them up for you. The last thing you want to do is scroll and have to add up things to start doing your financial analytics, right? You want to kind of know at your fingertips, um, what is our total facilities expense? Um, how much are we spending in data expense and, and keeping our offices connected and this EMR subscription license that's just almost pricing everybody out of the market. Uh, your monthly IT support, um, anything that you that is a, a big portion, uh, either financially as a part of your financial statements or what you talk about the most, is just to get all of those uh, accounts grouped. And, and, and again, I'll mention QuickBooks here. Um, I'm going to get to your question, Robert, in just a minute. Um, staff expense. Um, the title I'm going to show you. Thank you, Julia. She keeps reminding me to use my pointer. You're so nice. Um, uh, staff expense here in QuickBooks um, actually is an account. A QuickBooks will let you change the header of the financial statement, but it won't let you change the header of group accounts. You have to actually make this an account. Once you do that, you can go in and find, assign all of these accounts as uh, sub accounts underneath that. Once you do that. Uh, and try to never make an entry here. <laughs> Stay out of the parent account. Try not to make entries there. Put them in all your detail accounts. Once you do that, it will total staff salaries up for you. It allows you to do things like, you know, my depreciation or my facilities expense may have depreciation in here. Um, so will my equipment. You see repairs and maintenance here under equipment, and you see repairs and maintenance here under facilities. So sometimes it's important if our practices are big enough to break those out. And when I talk about repairs and maintenance, is it equipment or is it building? Because we argue over how much we spend on the building and equipment all the time, so I need to segregate that. Um, Robert says, how do you do allocation of common expenses across cost centers? Um, how do I do it in, in QuickBooks? Um, that income, let me see if I can scroll it back really quick to that income section. And then we'll move on. Right here. Um, direct expenses are direct. That's easy, right? I get an order that that's Dr. Taylor's uh, CME and that's Dr. Bethany's CME. And then all of these expenses allocated evenly. The practice is hashed out whatever's left here, and they don't leave much. But whatever's left here to evenly allocate, they're either splitting it evenly, or they may split it based on RVUs. They may split it based on uh, collections. Um, they may split half of it <laughs> evenly. They may split the other half based on production. So, and the way I do that in QuickBooks, that is a really long, laborious AJE once I figure out what that is. And um, we just do it. We just make an AJE, and then it all gets um, uh, evenly allocated based on whatever the algorithm for the practice is. Good question. Um, let's see. Displaying accounts in your report. Okay. We talked earlier about the account type is the, the parent hierarchy of everything. It determines which financial statement it shows on. It, it determines what order in that financial statement gets in. 
After that, at least in QuickBooks, if you're numbering, you're using account numbers, that determines what order it's going to come in. It'll be sequential. If you don't use account numbers, it's going to alphabetize everything. If you've ever wondered why advertising is always the first line item on your expense, and it's sometimes the smallest line item, not for everybody, but family practice certainly never spends a dime on it. But, and I don't want to see us advertising first. But because we weren't using account numbers and it was an A, it just floated to the top. So um, you can manipulate where things show up by using the account numbering system. Here's a better way to do it, um, and I'm sure Sage does this. Um, if you have a sophisticated report designer, you can probably click and drag things kind of where you want it. Um, but here's a little secret about QuickBooks. Go up to your list on your top toolbar and go to your chart of accounts. Once you do that, you're going to see all of your chart of accounts listed there, your active ones. Beside each account is a radial button. If you click and hold it and drag it up and down, if you grab an expense, it will let you move that up and down anywhere in the expense section. And once you stop and drop it, that's where it will appear the next time on the financial statement. So if you have parent accounts and subaccounts underneath it, if you grab the parent account, it will take all the subaccounts with it and put it wherever you want it. And I highly advocate um, putting things that you talk about the most um, at, the, at the top of the expense list. Because what happens when you flip a page and go to the second page, no doctor ever does. So keep the front page where your income is, where your heavy hitting expenses are, and you can do that easily in QuickBooks by going to the chart of account list and moving that radial button wherever you need it to go. Okay, so um, uh, let's get through this because this is kind of good stuff. <laughs> Custom management reports, practice reports, service reports, physician reports. I'm going to show you a couple of ones that I've generated. Generated practice reports, obviously overhead. Everybody asks about overhead. Let's compare some compensation reports and let's look at detailed expense reports for items that you're paying for in your practice. So on your screen is a practice compensation report. So why did I print this out? <laughs> this is a P&L, not a QuickBooks. It just doesn't have any income on it. And how do I do that? I go into the customized report function in QuickBooks, and I filter only for the accounts that I want to see. I don't want to see income here. I'm going to have a long, laborious four-hour meeting with my doc about compensation. And I only want to see compensation. I don't want anybody going down a rabbit trail or looking at any other kind of numbers. So I've asked QuickBooks to only show me the compensation accounts. And it will let you see your whole list of accounts. You go back and check the ones you want to see. I asked for it to give me this current year to date, the prior year to date. I also asked QuickBooks to give me the dollar amount of the change and the percentage of the change. That is on your customized report button. Go to filters, and you're going to see these down on a on a screen that you might not have looked at before, but if you're familiar with it, um, this is what will sit out. You just need to filter by account and, and get rid of all the other stuff you don't want to look at. And what this um, made up little report tells me, all the way over in the right down to the bottom, is that my compensation went up 5% from 2016 to 2017. And then if I look at each one of those areas, and don't look too hard because these are made up numbers, and it looks like my practice doesn't know what it's doing. It's got wild swings. But um, it will break it down by the um, chart of account itself. You've got to have the chart of account built right to get this, right? But after that, it's just a matter of going into your report builder and selecting what you want to see. A couple of clicks, and I printed this report out of QuickBooks in a second. Um, practice expense reports. We talked earlier about facilities and data. This is another meeting. I don't want to tack this on to an hourly meeting. You'll be there till midnight. But if we want to look at it, this is basically a truncated overhead report. I asked it for income, and I said, then tell me facilities and data extents only. You could easily put medical supplies or pharmaceuticals in here. Um, on this sample, I can quickly see, whoops, 
that facilities expense is 5.23% of my income. Uh, data expense is 3.27% of my income. You can have medical supplies in here. Uh, in QuickBooks, this little, variable, this little button is in there waiting to be clicked. You just want percentage of income, and then you're going to have to go in and select, I, hey, I only want to see these accounts. Um, service report, I wanted to explain a function for you um, in, in QuickBooks in case it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't, it's not intuitive. They have this um, percentage of, of row function here, and you'll find that on your filters when you go to print a report. What, what, what does percentage of row mean? So what this report is giving me, I asked for receipts and direct expenses, but I asked for only departments, ancillary and nuclear. These are where, this is where my procedure income comes from, right? I only want procedures. This is total procedures, and this will tell me that nuclear is 58% of it roughly, and ancillary is 52% of it roughly, of this total number here. So we're kind of looking left to right. Um, once expenses are taken out, we come down here to the, the bottom line, net income or um, gross margin in this case, because it only has direct expenses and not allocated ones, then nuclear becomes 47% of my net income, and ancillary becomes 53%. So this is an overhead report of ancillary, so although you could have asked for that, with 100% of income up here, and then each of these expenses as a percentage of that, it's comparing each one of, although it says percentage of a column, it's kind of comparing the rows, or no, percentage of rows, it's second dead on. Okay. Um, position report, compensation report, I'm going to give you a couple of quick um, examples of these. Uh, here's that percentage of row function again in QuickBooks. I'm sure Sage calls it something else. Um, here's your total, and you've asked the system for just position compensation, kind of like that um, salary report that we looked at earlier. And I want to compare Dr. A and B. And a lot of our practices have Dr. A, B, and we go on through K, right? Pretty big stuff. So the total over here is 1.2 million, and I can see that Dr. B's compensation is 64% of that, or 65, and that Dr. A's compensation is 35% of that. So when you get into um, looking at practice expenses as a whole, you can kind of uh, begin to run reports Let's look at this position uh, compensation. Um, down here, same set of numbers. I'm looking still at Dr. A, and I'm looking still at Dr. B, although I've asked the system to give me percentage of column, right? This is the total column. Um, Dr. A still gets paid $223,000 with all of his compensation there. But it tells me that his direct salary is 83% of it. It tells me that his health insurance premiums that we pay for him are almost 5% of it. His profit sharing contribution is almost 8% of it. So if you have those questions from your doc about um, pieces of their compensation, with just changing a little click in a, in a pretty unsophisticated software system like QuickBooks, you can get it pretty readily. You just kind of have to have these things grouped, right? You have to have it together so you, it, it looks um, organized and makes sense. Um, direct physician expense. Um, now I'm just looking at Dr. A. I just want to see what expenses we've allocated or what income we've allocated to him, um, and then any of his direct expenses as a percent of that and I'm coming down here to a gross profit margin for him. You know, and I could do this for any doctor in the practice. I could do it for any location in the practice. I can do it for any service in the practice as long as I'm tracking that. Uh, QuickBooks calls it a class, and they do have subclasses, and I'm sure um, Sage and other reports like it will let you do the same. Um, now, let's say all this sounds gravy, like great news to you. Um, and again, we're not talking about making accountants out of everybody. We're talking about just getting in and scrubbing up the chart of account, 
to get information that makes sense to you and kind of quickly. And by the way, whenever you build one of those custom reports and go through the hassle of finding all the filters that you need, save it. QuickBooks has a memorized report function. So once you get that report built, you can memorize it, give it a name that makes sense to you, and it will always be there for you. You can go in later and add an account if you find that you needed to create one or you want to include something else in it. But um, don't reinvent the wheel every month or every quarter when you want to go back and, and see these kind of numbers. Memorize them, those reports, um, save them in other um, software systems so that you can um, save some work for yourself. Uh, changing account numbers, let's say you're looking at your chart of accounts and go, yeah, it's a mess. I inherited a mess. I'd love to clean it up. What do I do? In what order do I do it? And, and when does it make sense? I can speak for QuickBooks here. You can change your accounts, your account numbers, and not lose your history. I did a little um, experiment yesterday. I took two existing accounts with, with two existing um, account numbers. Uh, they just happen to be dues and subscriptions and insurance expense, and I basically swapped the account numbers, but the money attached to the description stayed the same, so I could renumber dues all I wanted, um, and it didn't lose the financial uh, information. Current year, prior year, none of that. Um, I can't speak for Sage and Axiom and, and some of those other software systems, but in QuickBooks, you can do it. Now, it will alert you if you go to duplicate an account number will tell you you can't do that. So you might have to play around and if you want to renumber something, something that's already used, you have to go and change that number by 1 or 10 or whatever and um, then go back and reassign accounts, but you can do it. Uh, QuickBooks itself doesn't care about descriptions, doesn't know if you duplicate them, um, so be careful there. But you can go in just like account numbers and change your descriptions and um, uh, be no worse for the better, except um, you have to keep in mind if, if you've been using your internal reports to sit down and have meetings, it might confuse folks for a while. Um, so I say if you want to branch out new, uh, consider that. Um, if you haven't used account numbers in the past, I can assure you your accountant has. Um, if it's worth a phone call, you just to your accountant to you and say, do you have a number of these in some logical way that I might be able to use? They might make sense for you and they might not. I mean, the most important thing is to get something out of the system that you can use. Um, if your chart of account is really kind of unuseful to you now and you're not using your internal uh, financial statements coming out of your software, it might not hurt anybody to start now and to start using it. Um, Okay, that was a fast hour. So um, let me see. Uh, Kristen had to leave us. Sorry about that, Kristen. Um, Robert, uh, have I used QuickBooks allocation functionally to spread and allocate a transaction amount across multiple call centers and classes? Or have you found doing these allocations offline and Excel easier? Um, I have one practice with seven docs that likes to allocate everything down to the penny, including salaries, they will divvy them up. The practice happens to have seven docs. So when we write a check for retirement expense, uh, you wouldn't believe the scrolling that we do on the detail there. And it's classed out in that um, entry. But I'm sure there's an Excel spreadsheet somewhere that tells them which uh, salary employee belongs to which doc or which cost center. So um, they actually have an internal bookkeeper that does that kind of detail. If an adjustment has to be made when we get it to do the monthly income distribution, I maintain that detail. I, when I do an adjusting journal entry, I have to take it out of a department and put it into another one. Um, I don't do um, any of that work in Excel, although I suspect the client keeps that kind of detail on their end. Um, any other questions on how fun accounting is and what it's about? It's a good foundation. It's not to end all, to be end all. What you want to be able to do is, is print out information that makes uh, sense to you. But you do these, these, these are the numbers 
uh, and the categories that we're saddled with to get that done. You see my contact information there um, if you have any questions. Um, and then we have a they connect a page for PD Mayors. If uh, you like what you hear, we try to keep our blogs up to date and um, give you information uh, that's practical as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marilyn. As a reminder, if you guys have any last minute questions, please enter them into the chat box um, and Marilyn will be able to answer them for you. Okay, so if there are no other questions at this time, thank you, Marilyn. Um, again, there's uh, Marilyn provided her contact information if you have any further questions. Thank you for attending today's webinar. The recording will be distributed to all registrants through email. If you attended today's webinar as a non-member, please inquire about membership opportunities through your local NGMA chapter. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be sent a brief survey that will ask you to rate the webinar on a five-star scale. A separate survey will be sent to your email for a more in-depth look at today's program. That concludes our webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon.